Lisa? Mrs. Hench? We're good to go. Okay. Good evening. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Petretti, I'm calling the budget meeting to order. Good evening and welcome. So uh, this evening, um, each of the building principals and um, the department administrators are going to give you a deeper look into their budgets. Um, I give you an overview. I want to give you a quick uh, um, update on the budget. Again, the theme that you're going to see tonight is in all the work that we're doing, we keep bringing it back to the mission statement. It's, it's coming back into the budget, and you're going to see that this evening as the administrators do their presentations. Again, we are proposing the budget, $42,829,097, um, with a 1.5% spending increase over last year's budget. The tax levy is going to be at a 1.84% increase. Um, our allowable tax levy under the 2% tax cap is a 2.72 so presently we are 0.8% or 334,000 plus underneath the tax cap. So this has not changed since our our last meeting. Another way of looking at these numbers, again the budget to budget increase is a 1.45%. Our tax levy increase is a 1.84 and the allowable is a 2.72 but we strongly feel that we can, um, you know, create a budget that suits our needs at the 1.84. No need to go to the, the maximum allowable levy. Historically, this has been the allowable cap in blue, and this has been our budget the last couple of years. So traditionally, we are fairly significantly under the cap. So that's proposition number one. There will be three propositions on the agenda in May. Um, the second proposition is going to be expend in 4.2 million that we have in the capital reserve at this time. Um, that was established in 2018 for the following projects. It's the renovation of the STEM wing, um, updating that, that space at an approximate cost of 3.4 million. And we are beginning the process of recoding our roofs, the roofs in both buildings. Um, in the, at Cutshaw East and here at the Junior Senior High School uh, need to be redone. We're going to go with the recoding project with a 30-year warranty on it. And, um, you know, that, we'll begin that process. We think we can get about $800,000 worth of that work done, and we'll continue with it into the future. That will expend all the funds that we have in the capital reserve. The third proposition is going to be to establish a new reserve. Not that, that we're going to be putting $10 million into that new reserve, but that we'll be establishing a reserve in which we can fund upwards of $10 million. So a new capital reserve fund that would have a 10-year term, and we'd be using this, we'd be putting our um, surplus funds each year into this fund so that we can begin to get the work done um, on the projects outlined in the five-year plan. So those are going to be the three propositions. That will be up for approval in May. 
So there were some items, I just, I, I mentioned it to you folks last time, there were some items that we did remove from the budget. We originally came in at a much higher level, um, a much higher number. And so there were things that were pulled out of the budget that we think we could pay for now with some of our anticipated surplus funds. So these are some of the things that came out that we would like to get done now. So just because they were pulled out of the budget don't mean that we don't value these things. We do value them, but we think we can get it done now with funds that we have. Um, so we do propose using surplus from funds from this year's budget. So we'll be running these items through the Audit and Finance Committee for the regular board meeting next month because it's going to require some budget transfers. So we'll run this stuff through the committees and um, explain you know, the dollar amount attached to these projects and uh, what needs to get done. So I, I told you I'd let you know about these things and these are those items. So tonight you'll get presentations from Kutch Geese, the Madison Junior Senior High School, Special Education, Curriculum Innovation, Technology, Health, Phys Ed, and Athletics. Um, we'll come back on March 17th, which will be a regular board meeting um, and there, Mr. Coffey will give an update uh, from the business office and transportation. And we'll have an update from Mr. Kelly on facilities. And again, any, I'll update any changes to the three propositions that will be up for vote. And then on th March 31st will be another uh, budget hearing. I'll give a, an additional update as needed. Um, we'll discuss personnel and benefits, our debt service, our reserves, and our tax levy. As we get closer, Mr. Coffey will be able to, to finalize those numbers a little bit better. And then on April 14th at our regular monthly meeting, we will, um, at that point in time, we'll have to adopt a budget and any changes that we've made to it and also approve um, the propositions for the capital reserve. Sean. If, for whatever reason, April 14th, we don't adopt the budget, how much time do we have before it's an issue? This is the date. So it has to be done by the yes. 14th. Yes. Any, anything that we need to iron out as a board, we need to iron out by the 14th. Okay. Okay. Again, the budget vote is going to be Tuesday, May 17th, for all three propositions, 3 to 9 p.m. here at the high school gym. Um, additional information is available on the district website, items concerning the budget. And as well, anyone interested in running for the school board, uh, the submission of nomination petitions, uh, you got to submit a nomination, um, a petition for nomination. Uh, district residents who are interested in running for the Board of Education uh, can contact Mrs. Bieber, um, the district clerk at uh, Cutchog West or by email, and we'll get a, a packet out to you. Um, uh, George and Jen, you guys are up this year. You guys have received packets uh, in the items that you have this evening. And those uh, need to be signed and returned by the 18th to get yourselves on the ballot, OK? All right, Mrs. Brennan's going to present Cartogi's budget. Thank you, Mr. Petretti. Thank you, the Board of Education, and thank you to the community for giving me this opportunity today to present Cartogi's East proposed budget for the 2022-2023 school year. Um, as Mr. Petretti discussed, the, um, you'll see throughout my presentation how all of our students are meeting the vision of the mission statement. Um, you know, I also think some of the photos will show you some of the joy that we have at Kutchaugis and some of the joy that I find in the school. Um, recently at one of our faculty meetings, we were sharing a article, an article together called uh, Finding Joy in School. And as we reflected together and as I was preparing this presentation, I realized that the areas that you find joy in school are all directly related to our, our mission statement. So that was a kind of nice little finding that I found, and you'll see it streamed throughout the presentation. So this year we have common math benchmarks, K through six, that our students are all engaged in. Um, all our students have opportunities for STEAM. They're meeting um, STEAM once or twice a month, depending on the grade level and the availability. Um, there's 
very exciting projects always going on right now. Uh, the first graders are getting ready for a sunglass fashion show next week, which will be very exciting. Uh, they're studying and they're designed sunglasses um, and they're testing the UV protection of those sunglasses and the design um, and the wow factor as well, but as far as designing. So that'll be very exciting next week. I'm sure we'll share the pictures with everyone. Um, we're implementing Envision Math grades um, three through six. We're beginning a math pilot in K1 and two. We're beginning work in um, implementing multi-tiers systems of support for our students so that we can provide academic, social, emotional, and behavioral support for all our students. And the extended learning program is in full action right now, supporting our students in literacy and math. And we have implemented word study grades three through six, which is in addition to our, or I'm sorry, four through six, which is in addition to our K-1-2-3 foundations program. So in this picture, you can see a lot of our students in the STEAM lab, some in a math class, some learning outside. Um, you really see here where kids are really fostering collaboration, creativity, and critical thinking, really living through our mission statement. And here um, you have our kindness ambassadors who you had the opportunity to meet at the last board meeting. Um, our second grade class, this is their, part of their entry to their bulletin board that they're <laughs> collaborating on to create for the school. We have all the grade levels participating in designing bulletin boards around the building. Um, this is a, a literacy celebration that students were showing off some of their work um, in writing the workshop and their, their, they made gifts for their writing partners and they shared them at that celebration. Um, professional development, a lot of this is supported through the district's budget and the curriculum instruction budget. Uh, all our teachers have opportunities to have professional development in various areas so that we can ensure that our teachers are working with the most um, current, up-to-date instructional practices and resources available, relying on most current research. So you can see there's a wide variety. We have literacy, math, we have an ENL consultant that was in today actually working with our ENL teachers, word study. A lot of this is mixed in with our 30 and 60 minute meetings throughout the school year in the morning. Um, we also have instructional technology. We have the committee meets in the morning as well, and there'll be some professional development in our 30-minute meetings for teachers um, with some instructional programs like Seesaw for the primary grades. Um, and again, our faculty meetings, we always weave in some professional development, superintendents' conference days, and then teachers also have opportunities to attend BOCES and other out-of-district conferences. One thing that we added this year, which has been a really great asset to our school, is our literacy and math coach. Um, she facilitates professional development with our consultants that we have from the outside, and then bridges that connection to our classrooms. Um, she meets with teachers, she looks at student work, they make plans, and try to find ways to address students' strengths and areas of growth. She also does classroom demonstrations and co-teaching situations with teachers to support that and facilitates the development of and the revision of our pacing calendars directly in response to any kinds of assessments that we're doing. And she also supports our teaching assistants with professional development on days like um, parent-teacher conferences when they're available. And they'll be doing that at the upcoming conference day. These are some pictures um, of our literacy math coach working with a teacher and some students in a classroom. Is it sure. difficult for her to do the literacy and the math? Like, like I would assume there's, it's hard to do both of them. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's math and literacy, just like it, good practice is good practice, good instructional practice is good instructional practices, but the curriculum in both of those areas makes it a little bit, you know, it's more than, I was a literacy coach in my previous life, and so, you know, she's doing literacy and math, and it's, what's nice is, you know, it is, it is a lot for her, but she's able to bridge the connections for teachers and provide support, also with, um, stu for students with disabilities, because she has a background as a special education teacher, too. So I think that's where she bridges that in for everyone, and they can see that and transfer from one subject to the other. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so here you can see where she's working together with um, classroom teachers and ENL teachers to in create dynamic, flexible, and engaging learning processes for our students. And this was a quote. This is something that she really believes is true, like to inspire people, you show them their superpowers. So that's, that's really something she lives by. Um, these are some students in our school. This is a group of fourth graders who um, they developed or they're working on a little passion project they have for creating um, healthier environment and cleaner schools and places that they live. 
And um, so they came and shared that with me and we're working to support them and taking action in this area. So this is, of course, we brought back our band and um, chorus concerts this year. And these are two second graders who shared, um, they wrote this book together. One was the author, one is the illustrator, and they shared that book with us. And this is one of our clubs, the chess club. So we want to make sure that we continue to nurture individuals' passion for life and learning. Um, another way that all of our students are meeting the vision of the mission statement is through meeting social and emotional needs. We have a wellness screener, um, Naviance for our sixth grade. Second step, our school counselor provides support to our classrooms through bringing that into certain grade level classrooms to provide support for social and emotional well-being. We have a full-time shared social worker at Kutchog East. We also have morning meetings and community meetings that our um, school counselor does provide support to our teachers to help facilitate um, meetings so that our students have a place to begin their day um, with the healthy and um, healthy well-being. Um, Multi-tier systems of support I kind of spoke about earlier. Um, we're beginning um, to work with an, to create an SEL committee with the PPS department in Meredith. And, um, Supporting the SEL of our faculty and staff. I think that's an ongoing thing that we want to make sure that our teachers are um, in a good social emotional state to provide that same support to our students. So that's something we weave in through our faculty meetings, through our 30 minute meetings, and our 60 minute meetings. Amy? Yes. <coughs> you indicated that there's a shared social worker. Is that shared with the high school? Yes. Yep. And we're comfortable with one shared social worker between the two schools? That is how we've been working this year. Um, she's there on Tuesdays and Thursdays. She's at Kachog East, and you know she balances some work with um, with our school counselor and with our psychologist. So you know she is um, she. We did have a transition because the person who we hired for the year left, and she Regina came in, and she's doing a fantastic job supporting the students um, in the days that she has at Kachog East. All right, so we originally we started the year where we were doing. Um, half days and uh, the second student's assistance council spent half day at the high school, half day at Kachog East and we just found that that wasn't working and then when we had the transition we're trying something new um, you know where we have an increased need here at the high school but we also have the need at Kachog East and we're trying to balance that through one position being able to find two part-time people you know would be difficult so we're we're trying different things and, and we'll reassess and look at the model going forward next year um mr Bichardi, i just had a question um because i was looking at meredith's presentation that she's going to present in a little bit and it says two full-time social workers well we district-wide we have two full-time social workers we have one at the high school that's here solely at the high school and then we have the shared so one and a half here at the high school and then half yes part-time right. okay mm -hmm. yep. Um, again, our students um, have experienced an expansion, a return and expansion of some of our clubs this year. Um, I know um, if anyone's seen on the, has seen on our district, on our school website, we have the Kajogi's Club Flyer, which we update. Recently, we added in um, a hackathon, which comes off of our coding club. We added in a nature club, um, ultimate frisbee, and a morning fitness program. Our student leaders, um, our school leadership, you've seen it, the Board of Ed meetings, um, they organize our Spirit Week, they organize a Thanksgiving food drive, and during PSI Love You Week, they led the school announcements every morning, and you can see this picture here of them. And that's the Garden Club. Um, we always want to encourage a range of perspectives for our students, and this is an example of one of the classes creating a bulletin board, and this is in our main office, actually, so Ms. Kaiser and her third graders are putting up their bulletin board that they developed and designed based on the uh, Madatak Kachog mission statement. This is a literacy celebration in a third grade classroom, and this is actually another third grade classroom where you can see students in writing workshops. She has her writing spread out, and she's really involved in the writing process and revision and the development of her writing or well, all of them, but you can see particularly that student. Um, some other ways that our students this year are really giving back and living through the spirit of our mission statement is we had the Super Bowl cereal challenge recently, and you can see all the cereal boxes piled up here. They knocked them down in a domino effect. And um, we were able to collect, uh, I think it was, it was a lot of cereal. I think Raphael came over like three times to pick up the boxes to <laughs> deliver them. So it was quite successful. This was a second grade class, participated in October in uh, Socktober, where they collected socks and donated them. And this is um, 
a fourth grade class who collected change to save the elephants. Um, so they're making that donation, and this is student leadership um, food drive, and of course, Honk Jr., the Kachog East School musical, happened this year, and we were really excited about the message that that particular play brought to our families and our community. Um, and the sensory path is something else we're very proud of at Kachog East, and we appreciate all the support from the board with this as well. Um, our students are able to, at times when they feel um, the need to, re -regu to regulate themselves or gain refocus, they can leave the classroom with a teacher or a teaching assistant or take a walk through the hallway with the class and follow some activities on the sensory path to help them regain focus, re-regulate themselves and become ready for learning again. And this slide is where we talk about the enrollment over the years at Kutchog East. So um, this slide captures 2012, 2013, all the way up to what we project for next year. Um, and I color coded so you could see how a cohort kind of um, fluctuates over the years. And while you look at, you know, you can look here, this kindergarten class in 2012 started at 86. By the time they were in sixth grade, they were at 93. But you can see you know, some fluctuations, like up and down through those years. And the same thing happens pretty consistently over all the grade levels. So you'll see increases, decreases, and then an increase down here. So the one thing we did find is over time, you know, by the time they get to sixth grade, you're across the board, there is an increase. Um, but it does fluctuate you know, as, as those different cohorts uh, go, you go throughout the years. Um, I just had a question for yeah. next year. Are those increases taken into consideration in the projection? Yeah, so what we did is we, we kind of we looked at how these increases have typically happened. There's really no pattern. It, it kind of fluctuates a little bit. We're so. going to present, you know, the administration got together and looked at the numbers and together looked at potential sections for next year. And again, we're in that funny window because of our size. You know, a, a couple more kids could make us feel the need to increase a section. We lose a couple kids, as you see, we tend to do at times, where we would decrease a section. So we looked at each different grade levels. We actually pinpointed three grades that we really, it's on the next slide, where we're taking a close look, where we may be increasing or decreasing based on an increase or decrease in enrollment. So there's three grade levels that we're looking closely at. Do these numbers take into consideration any of the um any of the kids that have had come in during COVID, you know, from New York City? Yeah, I mean, that would be this, um, these two years that you're okay. looking at, right? So um, we didn't see the dramatic decrease this year that we thought we might. Right. Um, and so that's also another thing that we are watching because we know which grades those students were really in and we're, we're really keeping a close eye on it. Are you referring to these two years? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it looks like, except for sixth grade going up by two students. So every, really, what we every did. Every number seems to be going down. You know, when you look at that, really what we did is we just moved what our enrollment is yeah. over to, to the next, next year. year. Because sometimes it increases, sometimes it decreases. So the present enrollment's our best guess. Oh, and that's yeah, what we based yeah. our schedule off of yeah. for next year. So in this column, is this current year in February? It's in, this should be noted all these other years are the, um, from the New York State report card, and that's on Beds Day, which is in October. So this, per, this number here is February 2022. Um, and so when you see like this is, the, this is the current kindergarten, they're going to be the first graders next year. This is the current first grade, they'll be the second graders next year. And we just kept that same number for the projection with first grade through sixth grade. This just shows you how the cohort changes. Right, no, I got right? that, but are you anticipating, like Jen mentioned, an increase next year? The, no, we, we can't. can't tell. Some grade yeah. levels maybe, yeah. some grade, you know, it's, if you, if you look tell. at this, and it was really interesting, because we started going year to year, and some grade levels go up, some go down, but there's, right. there's really no consistency in that. Right. Yeah. So the best thing that we could do is roll these students up to the next grade. And then, of course, kindergarten, um, you know, that one I'll talk about next as well. Kindergarten, um, we, I can tell you how many we have, like, registering in the process right now and what it looked like the year before. 
Um, oh. That shouldn't be there. Um, so right now we have 36 students that are involved in being registered currently. We expect a few more. We're waiting to hear back from Head Start. Um, and I think alternatives for children still. But um, that's what we're looking at right now. And last year at this time when Dr. Devine did the budget presentation, there were nine, uh, 39 students registered. So we're a little bit shy of what it was last year. Um, so we're anticipating three sections for kindergarten next year. But again, you'll see on the next slide the grade levels that we're watching really closely over the coming months. Um, so I'm last year- sorry, Amy. Moment, when did the kindergarten registration start? Um, the kindergarten registration appointments were yesterday and um, the day before. So the process just started? The process just started. Um, we're in the middle of still doing outreach and following up and trying to get as many students as we can. But the, um, last year we started with the 39 and in October we were up to 58 in kindergarten. We and most of them were the in August. going to be fairly close this year. Yeah. Again. So we're, that's why we projected it to be like 55 we figured that was pretty close and a little bit under maybe. Um, in first grade, we had 58 last year. We um, project 55 because, again, that's that kindergarten moving over and three sections of 18 to 19 students. In second grade, um, we had four sections. We had 70 students in fourth grade, this, in second grade this year, but next year we're anticipating 58 because those first graders will be second graders and so we're anticipating class sizes of 19 to 20 with three sections. And again, we'll talk about where we're really watching on that next slide. Um, and it kind of follows through the same way. You can see the fourth graders, um, when they were in fourth grade, they were at 70. We're moving them up to fifth grade. And they're, um, we're expecting 70 there. And then sixth grade, 73. And then this, the fifth graders are going to be sixth graders at 75. So let me show you where we're really looking closely um, at kindergarten, first grade, and fifth grade. Amy, can you just go back one second? I just sure. want to highlight something. Yeah. So you'll see we do have, so presently there's 25 sections we're running in the, at the elementary school. We do have 27 sections in this budget. So there are 27 classroom, elementary classroom teachers in the budget now. Now these numbers, they don't include like self-contained classes. No. The sections don't. Yeah. The sections. Yeah, I didn't put them in on this slide. So, so if we need to, we, we have two spare teachers. Yes. Exactly. Yep. If, we get, if we get an influx of students in a certain grade level, and we'll show you where we're looking and anticipating, we may need those. Um, so we, we looked at what this year, 2022, 2023, what would be the recommended class sizes that we would like to recommend for this current, this upcoming budget? And, and I don't. I, I told Amy yeah, I'm probably going to keep interrupting fine. her during <laughs> this, this this part of her presentation. But um, you know, again, so we came up with these recommended class sizes, but we're basing that on where we are fiscally as a district this year. Those numbers could change. You know, so this is not something that we're saying as an administrative team. These are the numbers we recommend at all times under some fiscal stress, we might come back with some different recommended numbers for you. Right now, where we are, you know, we're in a good position, we're under the tax cap, our reserves are fully funded. These are our class size recommendations. Those are the windows that we're looking at, okay? And so we address them based on developmental ages of students and taking into consideration all of those things. Um, and so for kindergarten, um, that's one of the grades we're watching, obviously, because of the unknown, that we don't know who will come in August or September or in the next coming days. Um, so we're projecting 54, actually. And um, if the enrollment shifts above 58, we're making the recommendation to add a section. Um, that would bring us to four sections of 14 to 15 students in a classroom. Uh, for first grade, it's, it's similar because we're looking at similar numbers and a similar grade band. And so we have 55 students enrolled. Um, the class sizes at three are 18 to 19. If the enrollment, if it goes above that number 58, we'll, we'll be recommending to add a section, which would bring us down to um, four sections with 14 to 15 students in a class. And it's tricky because as Mr. Petretti said earlier, we have such um, a small district 
that those numbers, you know, it can be a too small of a class at some points, and then you don't have enough room for discourse and learning to happen if the class gets too small. So it, it, we really have to watch it carefully. Can and I, then, can I ask why second is not looked at a K through two? Well, because we're looking at here, um, like kindergarten and first grade, we were looking at their reading levels. Okay. And um, in okay. first grade, yeah. they move tremendously. Yeah. And in kindergarten, you're building up all those foundational mm -hmm. things. So that was why we looked at them a little bit smaller. Okay. Yeah. Um, and fifth grade, um, we have enrollment projected to be at 70 based on the current fourth grade. Um, if we were at four sections, you're looking at 17 to 18 students. Um, if the enrollment shifts below 66, we could make a recommendation to decrease a section. Um, that would bring the three sections would be at 22 versus the four sections 16 to 17. Um, and again, it, developmentally at the fifth grade level, when you have when you get too small, you sometimes it can inhibit the discourse in the classroom and the learning and the different perspectives and things like that. So we are watching it really closely if it if it um, and hoping that you know we can monitor it enough to make changes. And because we have those two positions that we put in the budget, we know that we can do that and add or decrease if we need to. Amy? Yes. Um, I just had a question. I, just, I really appreciate the charts mm -hmm. and going back with the enrollment so we can see the trends. Um, I'm just concerned with the number 66 because as the chart, the data shows, we've, most of the time we've seen an increase throughout the year. Mm -hmm. um, and if we start at 22, we could be looking at classes of 23, 24, 25, mm -hmm. depends how many kids. To get Really, to get to, to classes at 24, 25, you're talking of an influx of almost 10 kids throughout the school year. That, that's, that's unheard of for us. Well, it, it shows in the data. There are some years that we have had that's, that's, nine kids. That's year to year. That, that, that shift usually happens over the summer. That's not something that would happen in the school year. So, you know, again, if those numbers, if that's that window. So when we're getting ready to kick off at the end of August, you know, that's when we obviously have to finalize. So that was going to, actually, that should have been my first question. When is this decision made with? We follow, because we know that sometimes we get that lightning round of kids right before we open up. So this, I mean, we hired Mr. Monastery. Very late this very year. Very late, yeah, like very the last late. week in August. So pretend we could be in a position where if we get a bump in a, in a grade level, where we could add a section, um, you know, late in the game. But and then as the year progresses, if you get more students, you can't add a section then. No, you wouldn't so. do that. You would start the year at a number and that, you know, number so of So if sections. that could just be taken into consideration yes. that throughout the year. Um, it, it was when we came up with these bands. Yeah. Okay. yeah, and and that is why we're following it so closely because we want to make sure that if we need to make changes, we're, we're doing it based on that information. And this recommended class size, that's something that we just came up with. Yes. That's Yes. Very low yes. What yeah, we made it recommended based on Which this. We're fortunate to have, but it, that can't be ignored. Yeah, yeah, we made it based on this budget. Okay. The the position that we're in fiscally right now, we felt that we would be comfortable with these sizes, and given the current circumstances that we're in, like all the and factors. And the two teachers that we have in the budget. And we have the two teachers in the budget. Yep. So yeah, this this would not be if we were came into different times. We yeah. might have different yeah. recommendations entirely. Right, and we also have to remember the kids' education has been interrupted these past two years with the closures, the restrictions, and the quarantines, absenteeism. So mm -hmm. if there's any support that we can give the kids to give them an optimal learning environment, I, I'm in full support of that. Okay, yeah. thank That's you. That's why we're recommending if, those class sizes. Yeah, that, that is why we, we did do that recommendation, and we will be following really closely. Uh, Amy? Yes. How many different nationalities do we have? <laughs> How many different nationalities? So I'd have to look up the actual data for you. It is on the school report card, and I could pull it up if I went on the internet right now. But um, we do, just roughly speaking, we have um, students who, have, um, who, are in, who are English language learners who have, are new to the country or recently. Um, we have students, um, we have some students from Turkey. We have some students from Poland. Um, I'm trying to think if there's, I think Turkey, Poland. Alana knows if you want to ask her. <laughs> what? Alana knows. Uh, Alana, do you know? Yeah. Poland. Like Am I missing any? 
no, secondary level, we have some students from China. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, Miss Brennan, if budget was not a constraint, what would the ideal class size be, in your opinion? Well, budget's not actually a constraint in this scenario, right? Because we're recommending um, these class sizes based on the current budget, so it's not constraining class sizes. Um, you know, typically in first grade, it's, it's nice to see smaller class sizes, kindergarten, because kids are beginning those foundational literacy and math skills, and um, they're coming out of, like, kindergartners are coming out of UPK, which they might have two teachers in the room in a class up to 16 or 18, but the two teachers, so that's like a transition year. We're trying to build in a lot of the, um, the growth that we want to see in kindergarten. And then in first grade, they move from so many reading levels in first grade. There's, there's a really um, critical time there that you'd like to keep those class sizes low. And, and second grade, too, is a class size that you know benefits sometimes from smaller class sizes. As you move up in the grades, it's not uncommon to see classes larger than 24 in, in, you know, other, in other places at other times. Um, but again, for this school year, given this budget and the circumstances that we're in at Mattatuck Kutchog at Kutchog East this year, we felt that these were good recommendations. Um, you know, one of the things that impacts learning more than anything is, um, and a lot of the research shows, it's collective teacher efficacy. And I have to say at Kutchog East, there's a lot of that. Um, a lot of the research, um, can, you can look at research that shows class sizes versus what has an impact on learning and really the teacher's belief that students can learn is what has the greatest impact on learning more so than the class size really. So those things, again, this is based on this year's budget, this is based on this year's circumstances um, and um, what we're recommending this year. And we'll continue to follow it very closely. Thank you. Okay, and so this is actually the proposed budget. Um, I'll go through just some of the increases or decreases to just um, provide some explanation. Um, so you'll see a decrease in instructional elementary supplies. That's actually not a decrease, it's a shift from instructional supplies to instructional resources. Some things just needed to be categorized differently. <laughs> so you'll see the increase under, um, under this instructional resources to account for some of that. Um, in addition to that, there's an increase for classroom libraries. We want to enhance our classroom libraries more. Um, also, some foundations resources, um, some STEAM resources, and um, so th that kind of accounts for that increase. Also, sixth grade Amplify Science, they needed to have um, some resource kits provided for the students for the hands-on activities in science. Um, and that's some of the increases. Um, I, think, I think those are really the only, oh, furniture. So. Um, I'll show you on the next slides. We are increasing the proposed amount, shows an increase of $5,500 for furniture in the classrooms. We want to add some more flexible seating. That was something that was started at Kutchog East a few years ago, and we want to continue that. Um, you can see here, these are our current, these are the old desks that we have in um, third grade through sixth grade right now. And you can see they're outdated. Um, they don't work as well in small group collaborative settings like these flexible seatings have. Um, and then we're also looking at adding um, some, the, the classroom meeting areas where they had carpets were taken out during COVID. Um, so what we're looking to do is purchase these, um, students would sit on these cushions um, in gathering areas. They're flexible so they can move them around. They can all come and sit around the teacher while the teacher might have their mini lesson or read aloud. Um, and then again, that's the flexible seating. I'll show you a closer picture of the flexible seating. So this is in one of our current second grade classrooms. And these desks can be grouped in various different ways, so it's very flexible for the learning environment that we want to foster at Kutchog East. How, <laughs> ma how many classrooms are currently set up that way, and how many do we want to? So currently we have kindergarten, first grade, except one classroom, and second grade. And our Spanish classroom has them. And is so it basically new? Yes, yeah, so what, what, yeah, the, this is new that they're, I, I'm well, I, I love seeing this, I love seeing yeah. together, and I'm they, so glad the master gone. And to be honest, they, these are actually three feet apart, nose to nose. So oh, we've okay. had them like this in some classrooms for a little while, we measured, and nose to nose, they were three feet apart. So, but now you're seeing more, now that some of the requirements and restrictions and recommendations change, you're seeing, you know, I'm going into classrooms and seeing kids gathering together with the teacher, um, it's really beautiful to see them 
I mean, it together. I, I and sat in on my first morning meeting yesterday on the carpet with the kids yeah and it was great you yeah. know it was just it was just a whole different environment and, and the teachers rolling up their sleeves and getting back to some of their traditional practices yeah. it was it was awesome yeah it's great when you can metaphorically wrap your arms around your kids in a close group you know it's much different from being in rows so we're, we're glad to see that and we're hopeful that by adding this to the budget we can bring this into our third grade classrooms and have at, at this point k through three and then we'll each year add another grade level um, Mrs. Brennan, yes. I just had a question. Has there been an update on social distancing in the classroom restrictions? Or there has not. Not yet. No. The, um, th there's been some change in how we're handling close contacts and quarantines, and that went out in a notification to parents today. Okay. So, and it, see, I'm getting like four or five updates a day from the different organizations. So this is going to continue to to change and more. But um, you know, as, as far as the seating, no. Okay. Um, just about the desks, um, is there consideration of keeping some of these desks? Because I've heard from the students, some of them like the desks where they keep their, all their stuff. Um, well, right now, um, they are in kindergarten, first grade, and second grade. Um, these are planned for third grade. They do have like cubbies. They have like little baskets where they keep their materials in with these types of desks. Um, you know, right now, we have a lot of these desks around. Um, but it would be awkward, and you wouldn't really be able to foster collaboration if we mix them in a classroom. Um, so maybe, I don't know if, the yeah, if maybe the students can be asked. I yeah, I mean, I don't know if the whole class would be in agreement. That would be tricky. But we can certainly look for ways to find um, flexible storage options for them. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that might be something that a classroom teacher might incorporate. Um, students' choice and how would you like to store your things? What would work for our classroom community and things like that. Mrs. Brennan, yes. is there anything that's not in this budget that you feel like was left out or that you really need? That's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, I, I think that we've presented a budget that's, that's fair and reasonable given um, the situation and circumstances we're in right now. Um, you know, I think that we have, and I've tried to show that to you, that we've really enjoyed the support of the Board of Education and the current budget this year. Um, I think our students, um, you know, you, you can see in their faces, you can see the, um, the way that they are uh, really living through the spirit of our mission statement with what we have had. So, um, so you don't have a wish list? I, I, everyone has a wish list, but, you know, <laughs> I didn't take it with me today. <laughs> Um, Thank you for that question. I appreciate it. Just one last one. Can you just talk a little bit about extracurriculars and some of the clubs sure. and how that's been going so far this year? Yeah, sure. They're, they're actually very busy. Um, Kachok East is very busy after school, especially on Mondays. We have the extended learning program on Mondays and Wednesdays, and we have clubs up and running. Um, they're full. All of our clubs are very full. Uh, chess club is, we have chess club, which is very active. We have Lego club. Um, the mock trial is in full swing right now i think we have two sections of mock trial running and i think lego club runs two sections as well or art portfolio is running um we have nisma band and chorus after school now um it's actually it's a very noisy vibrant little place after school it's quite beautiful but um the uh what other nature club will be starting shortly the fitness club the flyer i think is going out today or tomorrow that's a morning club on friday mornings where students can come in for early morning fitness. Yoga club is running. Um, garden club will be starting up again in the spring. Um, am I missing any? You know, we had earlier ones in the beginning of the year, stage crew, the play. Um, those have finished at this point. I, Ultimate Frisbee club, I think that's gonna be pretty exciting. Um, I usually try to stop around in some of them because they, the kids are really, Lego club I went in the other day. Um, I came, I was in, uh, not that you need to know this, and I probably need to end this presentation soon, but I went to California over break, and I was in Legoland, so I brought them back a book, and when I brought it in the room, like, they ran over, like, can I have the book? I'm like, it's yours. So they're very excited and very appreciative that, not that they understand um, where the support is coming from, but we do appreciate the support from the board, especially in adding the additional clubs this spring, because I think we added four. So thank you. Can you tell me how many kids are in the extended learning program? We have about 70 total, I think. Is that the right number right now, 67? 77. So, and we are ending session one, and right now we're collecting the, yeah, it's nice. We're collecting the um, applications for session two. 
So we're in the process of that right now. So we're hoping the kids that are in will return. Um, I think the second session, we're gonna be competing with after school sports and outdoor activities and things like that. It might be a little bit trickier, but we have the buses, we have the three buses which come and pick them up and take them home. Um, they dismiss at one side of the building and the clubs dismiss at the other. Sure. I'll, I'll remind the board, th that whole program is being funded through the ESSA grants. Mm -hmm. So when those grants fall off, and this is something that we put in place, right? We talk about sustainability, the transportation, and so forth. Those are going to be things that may drive our budget up when those ESSA funds run out, because obviously it's, it's well attended, it's value. But and um, we'll be tracking the progress of the students. But we well. have enough funds for, le for next year. Yes, yeah. we do. Yeah. Yeah. Amy, I one other question. We're part of um, this process, we're going to be asking the voters to approve our STEM wing. Um, your STEAM program is going to really feed mm -hmm. the high school to, to, um, for these kids to show that interest in this. Can you talk a little bit about how excited the, your fifth and sixth graders, I guess, are? Yeah, I mean, going to feed this program. Yeah, the all of the students in the school love STEAM. I mean, I am out at the buses and at um, the drop-off in the morning with Mrs. Teppenharp, and the kids come out and they all, you know, they run up to her. They they. They have so much excitement from the STEAM lab. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the first graders are working on their um, sunglass design. The sixth graders and fifth graders have done things like the cardboard um, chair challenge, um, where Mr. Petretti tested out their designs. Um, it's really a very exciting place. You know, A day doesn't go by when I'm not trying to pop my head in there and see what the kids are tinkering with and learning and exploring. Um, and they're very, it's very exciting, so I'm sure it's gonna be a nice segue into the, the junior high, high school. Um, programs. Um, it's nice that they're having that opportunity at Kachog East um, to, to experience those things and engage in that and be prepared really for when they get to the junior high school high school. Thank you. Um, Mrs. Brennan, just yes. one more question on clubs. Um, for the STEAM, you mentioned that the students go about once to twice a month. Is there, are there any funds in the budget for next year possibly starting a STEAM club or um, maybe in the summer doing STEAM, just to get them more into the STEAM lab or increase their opportunities to be in there? Yeah, um, the STEAM club, I think in the past that has run, this year it ran under um, the Lego club and coding. Um, so it depends really on the interest and the, the teachers who decide to teach the club and where the interest comes. What we're really looking at in the future, and this is not something for this year, but maybe the year after, is having like a robotics club that can bridge from Kachog East to the junior high school. Um, so, you know, at this point, this year is how the clubs run. If, if anything changes next year, it might, but our bigger, we're looking more forward. Um, and how can we create a program. But I think the, the junior high school program has to kind of get its bearing first for us to then feed into it. So we do have sites on that, just it's, it's part of the plan long term. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, and in this slide you can see educators, students, families, and community members working together again, um, meeting the vision of the district's mission statement. Um, this, most of these photos are from our trunk retreat, which was a very successful uh, PTA-sponsored event. Thank you to the PTA. Um, we had teachers there. We had community members there. Um, we had PTA. We had um, students. Every, everyone was there. So we're looking forward to being able to, especially now given the new times that we're in, bringing back more events like this where we can welcome everyone into the school community again and work together. And thank you. That, that's, the, that's it. So thank just you. wanted to hope, hope you enjoyed seeing the smiling faces of all our students. Thank you again for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and I'm going to take you through the junior-senior high school budget now. And as you're aware, last year's budget had a number of items that addressed our building and our district goals. We added five new courses last year. The AP Capstone is a dual teacher course, and there'll be a second level of that course 
coming next year. It's not in this proposed budget. It's going to be a year from now. I'm going to be asking that we add the second level to AP Capstone. In uh, last year, we added AP Computer Science. We are adding a second level of that in this budget here. So tonight, I'm asking that we add that second level to AP Computer Science. The acting class was an English elective years ago that went away. We brought it back. And this time, we brought it back as a music elective, and it was taught by Jake Fowle. And our two food electives were taught by a health teacher, thus expanding the link between the classroom curriculum and the real world applications. We have professional development in math, literacy, and ELA, renovations to instructional spaces, and, addition, and some addition uh, new clubs. While we discuss the budget, we do have to remember, as, as Amy showed on her chart, we, we do have decreasing enrollment. So this chart is showing the cohort sizes along with the number of sections for, or the, for the core academic areas. Now in the bottom right corner, you're going to see where we have 4-5 projected. We're in the final stages of finishing the master schedule, and we're not sure exactly how many sections we're going to have uh, for English 12 and English 11, things like that, based on the, the schedule. So that may change a little bit. Otherwise, the sections are, are pretty pretty accurate there. And then this next slide, this ties in, whoops, one, one, two, one too many. There we go. This slide, it keeps jumping on me. There we go. This slide ties in with the student enrollment slide. Since 2010, we've seen a reduction in our English and social studies electives, yet we've had an increase in our science electives. Uh, also with that, Moving biology down to eighth grade increased the number of labs that we had to offer. And we added junior high math labs uh, recently to give some additional support to our students. So now turning our attention to the, to the actual budget lines that I'll go through. This, this budget, and there's a lot of lines in, in, this, in this budget, this entire building budget is 14,000 under last year's numbers. This is coming in underneath last year's number. The department coordinators, they did a phenomenal job of crafting a responsible budget that uh, is in alignment with our mission statement. When we look at this first slide, if I can get the their mouse here, the big number that drops, that jumps out as an increase is the 13,000. This is for video cameras. These are cameras that needed to be purchased. Uh, they need to be purchased. They were not in last year's budget. So we're looking to add them into, into this year's budget. On the next slide, if we go about halfway down, we see an increase here of uh, 2330, 2930. It says trips to museums. With the pandemic, we stopped going to New York City. We stopped going to museums. And we would like to, we're looking to bring that back next year. So that's why you're seeing a 0 to uh, 2900 increase there. But then as we go down here, you're going to see an increase of 4,600. So this is new. This is a new code that we added. And this is repair money. This is contractual money for <coughs> our video systems, our streaming systems, the TV studios, all the communication in this room. This is actually money that we moved from a code on the next slide. So this is more of a reallocation than it is an increase. But we listed it here as an increase. On this slide at the top, uh, you see a decrease of 1600 That's ENL supply money. We moved the ENL supply money out of this budget, and it's now in Ms. Finnegan's budget. We go to an increase of 3800 here in science. We have a new physics teacher. This is an increase in physics supplies. It's also an increase in some of the costs that we're seeing with the environmental science uh, purchases. Those costs are going up slightly. So that's why you're seeing that increase. Right below it, you see a, a bigger decrease of 6450. That was a one-time purchase for world history. That purchase was made last year, so that came off that came off from this budget. And then down here at the bottom, you see this giant increase or the decrease, sorry of 6,500, that is the money that we reallocated the 4,600 for the repairs to all the, all the uh, communication systems. So we took the money out of this budget, or out of this code, that was used to purchase the headsets that we saw used in the musicals and the plays, 
and now we're using that to repair things moving forward. On this slide at the top, we see an increase <laughs> of 2,300 in English. This is to replace, uh, replace paperback books. The books over, over time wear out. They, you know, they, they don't last forever. So this is, a re this is an increase to replace some books. We have an increase here in science of 1,500. That is specifically for an increase in chemistry review books. That is where that increase is. We're, we're increasing that, that number there. And then down here, this is interesting, you see two giant decreases. The first one, 8,500. This is foreign language. So the foreign language department for years has been using an online textbook. The company is phasing it out. And so they are letting us use it for the next two years as they're phasing it out, and we are not being charged for it. So it's something that we're, just, we're grandfathered in. We do not have to pay it. However, in two years, this is going to come back when we have to explore a new, a new resource. So that 85 is down now, but in two years, we are coming back to that. And the 6350 was a one-time purchase. That was for the, uh, for the AP World History textbooks. That purchase was made last year. So that comes, that comes off. Um, Mr. Smith, I'm not sure if you went over this. Um, for social studies, we're getting new textbooks next year? No. This is, th that was World History purchased mm -hmm. last year. This year, they are, they are piloting and looking at new, new textbooks for AP US History. And is that budgeted in here? It, it'll, be in, it'll be in Ms. Finnegan's budget. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. At the top of this one, this slide, you see a big decrease here, uh, $12,000. That's our BOCES number. The BOCES number is tied to our enrollment. So as the enrollment shrinks, our BOCES number is coming down. So that's why you're seeing, seeing that number come down. We go to the uh, middle of the page here, and now we're in guidance an increase of $3,100. This is bringing back the junior high planners. This is something that the staff has been asking for, so we're adding back in the junior high planners uh, into the junior high. We're offsetting that right here in, in guidance, or half, offsetting half of it. There's a decrease in college materials. Guidance is fi finding that more and more of the college materials are online. So they're not spending as much money on the college, don't need to spend as much on the college materials. So that has come down. And then that brings us to the bottom figure. And we're down to the, the total building budget is going to be $841,669, $14,098 under last year's number. So in this budget, we are offering students six new electives next year. Uh, AP Computer Science A, that's actually the second level of the computer science that we're currently offering now. Astronomy, Spanish 5, which the hope would be Spanish 5 now, and then that would transition into an AP Spanish the following year. So s next year wouldn't be Spanish 5. We're going to run it. We'd like to run an AP Spanish. Basic Carpentry we'd like to bring back, Digital Photography 2, and Ceramics 2. So, Mr. Smith, yes. Mr. Smith, I just want to stop for a, just a second. In the in the, the screen you showed with 2009-10 staffing in 2021-22, is there's a decrease in teachers, of course, over time. Mm -hmm. But with with you, are you able to add electives and other <coughs> classes and have two teachers in AP Capstone and still maintain those low numbers? Yes. Yeah. Uh, as, we're as we're working through the, the master schedule, uh, and, you know, we've, and I met with Mr. Petretti today and Ms. Allegro, we did some staffing. We are good with our staffing numbers. Oh, so you yeah. have to bring anybody else up. We're not, it, it, we may need to do a, a sixth class in, in one or two of the okay. subject areas, uh, but, but these numbers will, they'll, they'll be okay. Um, and are those numbers just because of enrollment or also because of the sixth class? That doesn't, that doesn't include the six classes. This, you know, you're talking, there's, there's different stories behind it. One, we know our enrollment's decreased. I did a presentation similar to this for the board um, a few years back and looked at, I think I went from 2006 to 2012 was when, when I did the presentation. Um, you've seen shifts in student interests in elective courses, that plays into it. Um, 
we added math labs for all of our students in seventh grade, so that, that bolstered that number. We've also added some math electives with computer science, so that's bolstering those numbers. Um, Mr. Smith mentioned that we added biology, a lab science, into eighth grade. Um, so there's another half a period for all students in, in that grade level. Um, you know, the, the low program would have been down, but we brought it down into seventh grade during this time frame, <coughs> increasing those numbers. And our ENL ENL needs are growing, as is our program. Yeah. So. And where we have, where we've lost some electives, like for years we ran history of rock and roll, which was a uh, social studies elective. Those, those elect, and the electives come and go uh, based on interest. But now you're seeing an interest in the forensic science, marine <coughs> biology, environmental science, uh, astronomy is going to be new next year. That will, I'm predicting, is going to be very popular. Um, and again, you look at something like basic carpentry. That's something that we had. It, came, it, it, it didn't have an interest for a while. Now we're starting to see the interest again, so we're looking to add that back in. Well, you also have an interest in the community looking for more right. classes like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and does. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, I'm going the wrong way. Uh, Thank you. Yep. And so, so in adding these classes, it's including our staffing, our supplies, and the professional development. We've added back in, like I mentioned, we added back in the field trips that we lost during the pandemic. And we continue to offer a large number of clubs and activities. So this brings us to the end of the junior senior high school budget. Are there any questions I could answer for you? I just wanted to make a comment. I think this is wonderful. When we look at Amy's budget and what she's providing for the students, and we recognize some of the new courses that are going to be available, it's because of all of the hard work of the teachers down at the elementary school. So when we look at some of those numbers, which initially I thought were smaller, I appreciate how you're going through everything and recognizing you know, the different abilities of the students and that allow us then to move them to these type of courses. So I'm, you know, I'm very impressed with both of them. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. I do want to speak to you. Right. We're not, you know, a lot of the reductions that we're seeing are for printed materials, things okay. that we were buying, Brochure. uh, brochures, things like that. And you're even seeing now uh, a lot of the college visits are now virtual. virtual. You're not getting as many college reps coming in. You're still getting a few, but you're not getting like you used to, um, which is good and bad. You're missing that face-to-face that -face connection, but now you are getting maybe colleges you weren't getting representatives from before. So that reduction there was more for just printed materials, brochures, catalogs, things like that. Okay. Okay? All right. Everybody. <laughs> okay. Tonight, as I present my budget, I would like to highlight the accomplishments of the PPS department and share with you what the proposed budget will support for next year. We continue to have a robust special education program at all levels, district-wide, that supports the full continuum of services. This past year, we added a new academic special class at the elementary level to meet the needs of our students while maintaining their placement in our district. Of the 10 students with disabilities who graduated last year, all of them graduated with a Regents Diploma, which is just a phenomenal accomplishment. Mm -hmm. We really have to thank our, our teachers for all of the hard work that they do with our students. <coughs> Each year, our vocational program continues to change and grow with the students. Our school store has been recognized and visited by many other districts across Suffolk County who are looking to use our school store as a model for theirs. Our job coaches do an amazing job working alongside the students at placements such as Splish Splash, Saks Fifth Avenue, McDonald's, Goldberg's, and PetSmart. <coughs> this year, all students and staff have benefited from the additional full-time social worker and the increased presence of the behavioral consultant. 
Additionally, we have continued our partnership with the North Fork Coalition, which continues to allow us access to programs and services that help with the prevention, um, the prevention from experts in adolescent and child psychiatry. Um, this is similar to what you saw in Amy's slide, but our ability to meet our students' needs and, um, and staff mental health needs continues to grow. We've incorporated an SEL curriculum at the elementary level, as well as created monthly mental health and wellness themes district-wide. As you can see in the pictures, we've just completed a week of activity centered around PS I Love You Day, which focused on positivity and kindness. Okay, so here's the actual budget. So you're gonna notice some shifts in the proposed budget for next year. Um, I just want to point out a few things. You'll see that there's a decrease in charter school tuition for next year, um, and that's just that we had um, less students who we anticipate attending charter schools, so it's, a, it's an obvious decrease there. It looks um, as though we're decreasing our funding for our various consultants um, and our related service providers. However, some of that money has shifted codes, and some of those services have been covered by my special ed grant. So we're not decreasing any of those services, we've just shifted the money around. Um, our BOCES code um, has increased, which you'll see happens to us every single year. <laughs> um, you know, bo our, it's really this year it was due to an additional placement of a student based on their needs. Um, let's see. Meredith? Yep. With respect to that, mm -hmm. um, Sometimes these sort of things happen unexpectedly, mm -hmm. last minute. Um, is there some funds in here with the unanticipated that something might happen? We, we do. Yep, yeah, I do have a line in my budget for unanticipated placements, and I did increase it a little bit this year um, because we are seeing that it, when we send students to BOCES placements, it's not only it's not that they have um, significant academic needs that we can't meet. Sometimes it's the social emotional needs and we've seen an increase in students who, um, with all of the resources that you have supported me with, with the behavior consultant and the social workers and the psychologists that we have in our guidance team, um, sometimes we're still just not enough and students need a more therapeutic environment. We've also had um, seen a slight increase in students who go to a temporary placement for therapeutic interventions and we're responsible, you know, my department's responsible to fund that. Um, but it's temporary and then they're able to come back into school. So there's a lot of different shifts that happen. Um, but we do have, um, we do have some money set aside for those un unanticipated costs. And is that in a line item that we're gonna go over? It's, con it's con on these sheets it's condensed and it's in the, I'll tell you which, it's in the, it's in the, Bo it's in the BOCES district wide. You'll see that that one increased ninety three thousand dollars. Okay, so, yeah. so it's our, there. Okay. <laughs> it's my biggest increase. And Meredith, I just want to say the fact that you and your team recognize when someone needs something more than we can provide yep. is really an exceptional skill. Mm -hmm. And um, I, you know, I on behalf of the community, I thank you for that. Well, thank you. I mean, I'm honored to work with the the team that I have. They're they're just they're they're so on it and they're always recognizing what the students needs are they're in constant communication with the families when when needs arise so i just I'm, i have to say i really i'm going to send them that thanks to them because they really deserve it all right where am i um okay so for this coming year you're going to see on this slide many of the items that i've spoken about tonight um, our goal is to continue to provide our students with the best program possible as you'll also see on this slide in the in the bottom left hand corner um, our programs are able to support neighboring districts by allowing tuition, uh, students to tuition in. So that's, you know, it's a benefit for our district. And it also helps us keep, like, we're a small district and some of our special classes tend to be smaller, but if we tuition students in, it allows for, you know, the additional students and additional socialization within the classroom. So I always think that that's a nice added benefit. Meredith, this is a full-time behavioral consultant in district. Right, so I... And this says a point eight behavioral... So this year she's a point eight, and okay. I'm, ho I'm hoping to increase her to okay. full-time for next great, year. Great. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Uh, so this, um, this budget is going to, you know, to your point, George, this budget will allow us to be ready and prepared as best as we can. 
to meet the, um, you know, the unexpected placements and needs that, that come up. Um, but before I close, if I, if I can, I would just like to share with you one of our many success stories. I think it's important to always bring it back to the children. So we have a senior this year in the vocational training program who's going to receive his skills and achievement, achievement credential this June. For the past six years, the student has participated in school and community-based vocational training as well as BOCES for food prep. The student currently has an individualized plan for employment and is il eligible for Access VR and OPWD supports. He utilizes the SCAT transportation for his travel needs. Upon graduation, the student will continue his post-secondary education by attending BOCES for a second year in food prep program. He will also continue to work part-time at Saks Fifth Avenue, Splish Splash, and Goldberg's Bagels. So he's currently here and has some paid employment through the year, and then he'll continue with that once he graduates. So we're just um, over the moon proud of him. Um, I think that's the end of my budget. So I just want to, again, thank you for your continued support. I want to thank the community for continuing to support our program. I appreciate it. Really do. Bernard, if, uh, <coughs> we, we take in some students for tuition. Mm -hmm. uh, how many do we not handle? How many do we let go to BOCES or other facilities? Um, next year, I anticipate having four to five students full time at BOCES. Um, but, and again, that does sometimes change mid-year, um, depending on, on student need. We're, we're very good at projecting the academic needs of students. However, there are some times where behavioral or social-emotional therapeutic needs um, come up where we, we're no longer enough for the child, and it's only in their best interest to make sure that they're in an environment where they can learn and grow. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, th no, thank you so much. Best buddies can do trips next year. Uh, they, they have gone on some trips this okay, year. Okay. I, yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. I didn't put pictures in this year. I just wanted to, um, for confidentiality reasons, I wasn't comfortable <laughs> doing it. But um, we did, they did, they went to the, so far they went to the light show. Um, Ms. Bieber, you could, light show, and did they go somewhere else? We did um, a light show. Um, we've done a friendship walk around the track. Right. We have some oh, other nice. things planned for the spring. Yep. Some more uh, best buddies. And then I, I was getting pictures from the ski trip of like our, our special education students with their general education peers who are like know each other and are very comfortable with each other, you know, from programs like Best Buddies. Yeah. So it's great. Good. All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I think I just might have broken it for her though. Hi, good evening. So, presenting the curriculum budget, which um, much of what you um, are about to see here, you've already seen through the buildings, because the curriculum um, instruction and innovation budget supports both buildings. So, anytime we come up with short term or long term initiatives or ways for new courses or you know quality instruction and curriculum um, we collaborate together um, the three of us along and we come up with plans and this budget you will see supports all of my classes okay so over the past year and you've seen these on both of the slides prior so I'm not going to get into it but <clears throat> they're talking about what's happening in the buildings but um, you'll see that these are the funds that make some of this happen, and these were just some of the highlights um, that you've already heard tonight of what we've done in regards for professional development and training, curriculum writing and review, <clears throat> and also then giving the um, students and the teachers the resources to make that happen. Um, so you'll see there's a lot going on here. <clears throat> as far as um, advanced coursework, intervention, um, enrichment, um, in order to provide a well-rounded education, K through 12. Um, you'll see a lot of the work that we've done through professional development and training and resources really about aligning K through 12 so that the work that the students are doing throughout each year, they transfer to the next year and that we can build so that it's not 
you could have a really great year in the classroom in a grade but if you can't tr you have to be able to transfer those skills into the next grade so finding common language common ground assessments and language that we can all talk about and look at um, and make good decisions so there's been a lot of great work done and um, a very um, talented faculty so uh, as you heard before, um, there's been some code shifts in this budget as well. The, um, the overall, the budget has decreased by 41,500, I believe. Um, part, in fact, to the, that we had front-loaded and were paying for the math programs over the past um, year, so that was a big investment, it's a six-year investment. And then we also, um, took out some of the contractual money because we were it was in the wrong code where we were paying teachers for curriculum work and training and whatnot outside of the school day or summer programs and it really belo it belonged in the salary code so we had to take some of that money out of contractual and put it into salary code um, I believe it was to, to the tune of twenty four thousand dollars total but that's that's part of that money um, you'll see that um, another one of the reasons why when you look and you see Kachag East is um, higher than the high school was part, part in part due to the math and literacy initiative because we're only in middle school in the high school so you're you're training and um, developing seven grade levels as opposed to two grade levels and that was the cost there you're going to see contractual money um, professional development money in here and then you'll see it in the grants now the grants, the title funds that you'll see later, they're, it's called supplement and supplant. You can use those funds only to, in addition to what your district is providing. So you can't not have the district not paying for professional development, right, for intervention or for things like that, okay, and then use title funds to supplement your budget. Does that make sense? So that's why you'll see it in the, both of those places. You know, the question would be, why not just use all grant money? Because you can't. We have the district has to provide a certain amount of um, professional development. Um, well, can I ask you with curriculum, like with math, like Amy mm -hmm. mentioned in vision? Mm -hmm. Just because I don't know what, like these new things. Is it is that software? Is that book? It's everything. So it is like right. Mm -hmm. there, uh, so there are parent resources. We're actually having a math family night in March 15th um, okay. because it is a new program. We did have um, parent feedback and input on choosing this program. We did pilot it for a year with um, more than one um, vision in HMH. So because we want the parents to become familiar, because there are a lot of parent resources that we did need to get we need this is our first year of adopting this so we the teachers and the students needed to get a good grounding before we were really feeling prepared to teach there's a lot of training that goes on okay. um, and whatnot so we are hosting um, a family night I think only it's, 17 people have as of today responded. there were 17 people um, I think yeah 17 people before I left mm -hmm. the office today okay, good. and on the last board meeting you approved teachers to be paid to for, to facilitate that night parents who come in and experience the lessons and we showed the resources okay but is it mostly software no, no. it's okay. they have workbooks they have okay. it's digital it's print it's a whole company video it's all modalities of learning okay thank you okay um i talked about that um you'll see conferences went up a tiny bit because we can go to conferences now so when teachers a lot of the conferences are when teachers have their own professions that I want to get better at, and it's not a district-wide initiative, the one-off, that they're able to now attend conferences, whether they're um, virtual or on the weekends not. So this supports that. We have conferences that are general, and then we have conferences that are supported and funded, or uh, we participate through BOCES, so you'll see them in two places. Um, our conference money went up because we took out guidance and art and music that used to be in the building budget, and it's now in this budget. Um, AIS went from curriculum budget to the building budget as well and um, you'll see 
instructional resources at CE is going lower now because of what I said, we already prepaid for a lot of the literacy resources and the math resources ahead of time. But the high school instructional resources are going up. Um, that's, it's been, that's a revised description there, but that is due to um, the new courses. Anytime there's a new course, the curriculum budget funds it in its first year to get the startup, to get it set up, and then the building budget supports the materials thereafter. Um, so you'll see this one we budgeted for astronomy, AP computer science, and we are also looking at um, new ENL curriculum resources. We did, we had read 180, we're not using that anymore. We've since working with the consultant, we really are um, changing that, um, the curriculum instruction and model there. And we are looking at uh, piloting US history this year, which there'll be a committee and um, we'll go through that together as a school community. And so I did budget for, I got some quotes of approximately what it could cost over a couple of vendors. And then we, when we decide where we're going for, we will have pay for it through next year's budget. Okay, any, um, oh, and the other piece was the, and I think this is on the next one, is summer. That's down because, and again, I can't, we still have to pay for some summer. We have, you know, so we would pay what we had normally, and this is consistent over the past several years of what we, as a district, were willing, um, had budgeted to spend was this $12,000. That's still in the budget, but it's in the salary code. Okay, because it's mostly that. Uh, Alana, if you could explain to me a, a little bit. Um, curriculum, it drives what we do here. Um, and to just take a look at the total budget of 167,000, or that was, that was last year, yeah. 126,000. <laughs> All right, I understand that some of it was moved to other codes. Mm -hmm. um, but we're, we're spending 126000 to drive this school. Mm -hmm. What am I missing? Well, what you're, I think what you're missing is that there's been a decade of an investment in materials. So curriculum is, you know, what you teach, right? The resources, right. you know, you know, or the things you, you know, the, the concrete materials to, and then, but a lot of curriculum is, in instruction is in your salary code. I mean, it's the people, it's the teachers, and you know what they're doing, and how we're training them, and effective instruction is in the you know implementation of the curriculum. We can have all kinds of curriculum in front of us, which we have, you know, units of study. You've seen units of study in libraries and all kinds of things, but it's your salary code, you so know, you, and supporting you, that is is probably the one of the bigger drivers. So you have everything you need. We have budget. everything we need, but uh, in the capacity of what we can do in a year. So there's a lot, we have work to do, and we have short-term and long-term goals to do that, but you only have enough time, enough capacity to pull teachers out of classes, to get training, to get consultants. Like, I feel like we're, we are really sort of maxing out as it is. So you have to build the capacity and you have to have a plan that actually you do something that can stick and transfer as opposed to piling on. Right. That's really okay. where I would come from with that. Great, thanks. No, thank you. Alana, I have a couple questions just about summer and robotics. Um, I know I keep asking for this for summer program for the kids. We have literacy and math, but an enrichment program. And I bring this up because we've been talking about it for three years. Mm -hmm. And I know last year it was gonna be pushed off for this year. Mm -hmm but I don't see it in the budget. Um, is there any? So we, Amy and I are looking into a few things. Um, we, we have a couple of ideas. I don't want to say them because I don't know what's going to happen. The, if anything that we did in the summer right now could be supported through the federal funds. Um, so I'm not worried about that. Honestly, the biggest concern is the staffing. I mean, right now our extended learning program, we're, not, we're understaffed and we're still trying to reach out to get more people even for this next session and I'm concerned. So, it, that, so we can and we're looking into some things that could be sponsored by other places like there's a BOCES program, the Camp of Dement Invention, there was another um, Lego, uh, was it the Lego one we ever yeah. zoom on for mm -hmm. next week. So we are looking. 
We are looking. Because I see other districts run summer programs from nine or short ones from nine to eleven mm -hmm. for kindergarten through eighth grade, um, or maybe we could reach out to teachers from other districts if our teachers yep. um, can't, mm -hmm. uh, just to provide that opportunity for the kids. Um, the other one is robotics. Was there a robotics club this year? Uh, was a robotics club run this year? It was at Kajogis. No, I'm sorry, at the high school. I it's going to. It's, it's in going the spring. To. Yeah. It's going, it's going to. Spring, to. Okay. Yes. So, because I just see robotics competition kits. No. So for next year, when it's yes. instructional materials, is that a so course? There's a club, and then there's a club? competition level. So there's two different. There's a couple of different scenarios for robotics. Yep. So for next year, it's a competition and the club. Hopefully. 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 Okay. Hopefully. Well, that's okay. Yeah, Thank honestly, you. some of the those those kits are back ordered. So I think every district's trying to buy them, and we're having a really hard time getting them. Okay, so thank you. We have, yeah. And we need the STEM wing will help because we have a place. So, um, and so for um, next year, it's very similar. You're going to see um, a lot of the same things. We're going to continue um, with the work we're doing, um, and adding on. So there's really nothing new, and you saw a lot of it in the past. I just want to take a, um, a minute to go over what we, in addition, that also supports the curriculum, professional development, and training that's not in your general budget, but is in addition, is funding that in addition to. So every year, we have the four title funds. There, it's typically about the same amount of money. It's based on um, actually your poverty levels, your economically disadvantaged poverty levels, and students that receive intervention other than obviously the Title III, which is based on the numbers of English language learners. That has gone up. We used to not have enough money, and we'd be in a consortium now. We can use it on our own. And then Title IV-A, which is anything to do with mental health, technology, anything to provide advanced courses, anything to provide a well-rounded education. So approximately that amount, that's the amount of money that we were allocated this year. So that's every year. You have to use the money up within the year, and there's a lot of rules and um, a lot of hoops to jump through to get it, but we do it. Then this ESSER ARP is all about um, the impacts of COVID pandemic um, on our students. We got two allocations, ESSER two, which I have it to 2023 because it only runs through 2023, and you'll see the ARP, the American Rescue <coughs> Plan, runs through 2024, which is why we can have those programs the summer, right? So the lion's share of the American Rescue Plan is really going to extended learning program with the transportation. We do have room to run more, and we're going to try to because we, I did, we did have to add a bus um, to the extended learning day program, which did add money, but we had, we had a little bit of wiggle room. So we'll kind of play around with that. Um, but these are just some of the highlights of how we're funding, what we are funding um, through these funds, which is, you know, uh, a lot of money there, close to half a million dollars, okay? Again, you'll see some of the same things because the district has a responsibility to pay for certain things, and this will just be in addition to. So, Alana, this has classroom libraries. Mm -hmm. This has nothing to do with the regular library. The no. Yeah. No. No, that was the beginning of the year. We had started that a couple of years ago. We've been building them back. Um, and we've got, we did a lot of it through federal funding over the last yeah. couple of years. And now Amy's just going to finish up you know, what's left. So Kudchuk East will be in good shape. And we also did 7 through 12 as well last year. So we're in pretty good shape there. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Good. Thanks, Thank you. Mom. Thank you.
Okay, great. So technology. So, um, you know, once again, I want to thank everyone for their support for all of the um, fabulous technology that we have in the district. Um, so I want to talk like, you know, I know we're talking a lot about the five-year plan and stuff like that, which a lot of that will, you'll see the technology because, you know, over the past like 14 years, we've really come a long way in building our infrastructure and stuff like that. So a lot of my plan is talking about like um, refreshing, refreshing cycles and stuff like that. So um, with technology integration, it's not just the computers themselves, it's your de devices, your professional development, your curriculum and instruction, your financial planning for your technology, your infrastructure, and now we, we include the data and the security as a big item in our technology planning stuff and our path. And with that, it's always with all the students meeting the vision of the mission statement through technology and the support that we can provide for the students with technology. So, um, you know, planning for the 22-23 um, budget and into the future is about enhancing, sustaining, and maintaining what we have. So. You know, last year we went one to one completely for grades K through 12, which was a big um, leap for our district. You know, during COVID, we purchased a lot of software for synchronous and asynchronous learning for the students at different grade levels. Um, you know, we, we were lucky that we were able to get devices for teachers, teacher assistants, clerical staff, you know, all administrators. Anybody who needed a device was able to have the device. We were able to provide them to the students at home. Um, we were able to provide MiFi devices wherever was needed for the students. Um, and we did our digital equity survey this year. And you know, even then, we keep reaching out to see what do, what do families need. You know? So um, with that, um, part of my um, vision right now, I'm looking at the five-year plan, but my project includes this solution called Hyperflex. So I do have pictures afterwards, because I know some of this gets confusing. So Hyperflex is our storage. We're going to replace our servers and storage in our main network operations at the high school. So this is like the start where everything goes. So we're going to start working on that this summer. Um, maintaining our infrastructure, our updates and our resources, and we're upgrading our endpoint protection to be more in line with another system that we're doing. So the endpoint protection is what sits on every computer, every device before on, in each classroom. So everything comes in, that's like one of our lines of defense. Um, continuing to support our one-to-one -one initiatives, we were very lucky we didn't have to do a refresh of any iPads this year because we had them. Next year, now, remember we used to be on like, when we were only, five through 12, we were trying to target like two grade levels a year of refresh. But now that we're K through 12, that's going to change. So we'll be working on that. Um, we will be able, I did have some smart schools money left over from our initial investment that we said we would target, but I think we have about $7,000 left that we can use for Chromebooks in the future. Um, and then we'll just look at the devices and we'll com we're coming up with the new replacement schedule. So it will most likely be probably three grade levels a year. As we go forward, the devices usually last five years average. Um, continue to provide professional development for teachers with software for the synchronous and the asynchronous learning. Even though kids are back in school, you know, we, we purchased a lot of software that really has proven to be helpful to, for teachers in the classroom. So, you know, We've done a lot of um, auditing this year of our software, and we found out some, like we got rid of some software that teachers really relied on when they were at home, and now we really haven't used it, so we don't need it, you know? Um, we've done surveys, um, asking the teachers what's working, what's work not working, and we've also, we do class link right now, so we're able to look at audit logs to see how many students logged in, how it's being utilized, you know? And, you know, we found like with certain software, we only had two, two or three teachers using it last, this year, so, it's something that we don't need right now. Um, we just completed an upgrade of our copiers. We're in the process of it right now. That's been a long time coming. Many of our copiers are like from 2011 and stuff. So, I mean, it's a little bit of a growing pain right now, but we'll, we'll work through it. And then, um, so I talked about the audit. And then the next part is just the data privacy and the network security. This is really big. It's something that's a constant focus. It's at the forefront of everything that we're doing now you know, coming along with staff development for the teachers, the training, the training videos, just constant reminders of, you know, like, be, you know, don't click and be safe type of thing, you know. And we did make some more, like, lockdown and restrictions with all the of other things that are going on in the world, too. So with that, this is a basic diagram, right? <laughs> so, You're like, a techie. <laughs> In the middle, right, we all start, our internet comes in and it hits the firewall when we talk about firewalls, right? 
So then the firewall goes to our core switches. And if you look to the left, right now we have all of these servers. This is what we're upgrading over the summer. We're going to upgrade all of those servers on the left-hand side. And what's going to happen is within, it's called like virtualized servers. So within each of those servers will be storage solutions built in. So if one thing comes down, it automatically has redundancy to go back up. And then you're kind of converging mm -hmm. them. Then you have like your core switches. And when we talk about the access points, right, we always say like, we need more switches. We can't just throw another camera up there because we're running out of ports on the switches. Because now when you look at what we've done on the right hand side, we have our, all our surveillance cameras, the computers that are in the labs throughout the district, your printers, your copiers. Now we have our door swipes that go on, our telephones, and all our wireless access points. Those are all endpoints that we have to protect and they all have to get plugged into a switch. So now when we start talking about our five-year plan, this is, this is where it starts to get, like we want to break it up over the f five years and do one project this year, because that's going to be an item that will probably stay in our budget and hopefully be partially financed by the capital reserve and then also through some of our E-rate funding. So, go ahead. J just to clarify, when you mention your five-year plan, these are things that you need to do over the next five years that you're going to build into your budget. It's not hitting the five-year plan that Sean's been talking about. Some of it some might of it hit is. into Sean's. It's going to be a combination yeah. of both. Okay. Yep. I have some funds to offset it, but it's like the, like we made this investment. Now it's coming. Now we have to keep the investment going. So, um, George, just as an example, so the segment of the switches, and I'm not going to try to name it because I'm going to name it wrong, um, was in the budget. It's one of the things we pulled out. Um, it was close to $200,000 that we pulled out of the budget, but then we got the pilot funds came in, and so last minute it went back into the budget. So there's components of this that we're going to try to do in our annual budget, Jerry's annual budget, but those things that can't be done are things that would be part of the five-year plan right. and utilizing the capital reserves. Okay. So, um, so looking at this, so our, our camera replacements, this was just, we, we still have some camera replacements in our budget, but we're moving it out of my budget into the security code. So some of these things are just moves, right? Um, the second line item is that 152, that's for the hyperflex that Sean just said. We originally took it out of the budget, but now we're putting it back into the budget. Um, and then if you look, the next one is the instructional technology right here. Um, this is also part of that hyperflex project, right? So it's, it's going, and then included in that is like, our firewall costs, our hyperflex project, our costs for our barracuda, our um, endpoint protection, our Go Guardian is no longer with BOCES. It was with BOCES, and then there was a data privacy thing where BOCES didn't sign on with Go Guardian. So now that's <laughs> back in our budget. So it came out of BOCES, and it's in my budget. Um, so that's what those increases are. And then on the bottom, the last line, like the notifications, those are mostly BOCES increases. BOCES did at least a 3% increase. Those are BOCES instructional products. So, um, and we added back in, we took out, um, what was it, Dave? What did we took out? We just added back in. Um, um, passport, for passport for good. We originally took that out. That was like 5,000 and we, put, we wanted to put that back in. So, so th that's. So this is Hyperflex. It's the solution. This is the Hyperflex is going to tie all of this together in a in a ser, SAN server solution. It's a VM solution. It's all of your servers. Then it's now called Hyperflex. Okay. Did it have another name? No. It's just like so. Right now we might have like a Dell server. So it's a Hyperflex, and they have Cisco servers. So it's it's just it, it's all it's called Hyperflex. I can get you more information. Sorry. It's the name of this whole thing. Okay. Yeah, I believe it might even be, I think it's a Cisco product. I have to, I'll have to, you know what, I'll have to double check. Cisco. Cisco product, yeah. Okay. Right, because he's done it through core, so. When Jerry came up with this, she kept trying to explain it to me, and I, I just wasn't getting yeah. it, and she said, yeah. I'll be back, and she came back down with the diagram. <laughs> and Simon helped with that. Who does so. cloud storage? Sorry? Who does our cloud storage? So we do, we have our cloud storage through Microsoft. Yep, and then we also have Google for the instructional side too. Okay, and that'll remain the same? Yep. Okay. Yep. Jerry? Yep. Um, in the news for the last year or so, a lot of schools have been getting hit, and I know we have you know, pro, uh, software that, that gives us some protection. Is there any protection that's just 
too expensive that we haven't purchased or are we doing everything that we can possibly Yeah, we do? are pretty, we have multiple levels of protection. And I think, you know, look, you can never be too safe because you're only as good as, I don't know, like, you know, whatever. Like, I mean, we put, I talked to Sean about some security things that we put into place that might, you know, be a little hiccup, but I don't, I'd rather talk more about stuff like that in exec session and not publicly. Mm -hmm only because this is being recorded and stuff too. But yep. I think we're good, but I'm always looking at next level stuff, okay. you know, and always looking at the security side of things. You know, I do have monthly meetings with BOCES on it and stuff like that. So, um, and we do have quality stuff. The most important thing is when something is end of life, you don't get updates anymore. So that's why as this stuff becomes end of life, like someone had asked me, do we have to do the hyperflex? It's end of life, you have to. Because right. if you don't do end of life, you don't get updates. You don't get updates. Now you're just you're vulnerable. Yeah. I just want to make yeah. sure that yep. if, if there, if you think there's a need, that you at least bring it to us. Yep, absolutely. You don't just say it's too expensive. Nope, nope, absolutely. Because yeah. it can really hurt us. She'll let you know. Gary, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you only hear about the ransoms where things been shut down. We have the backup that that won't happen to us. I can't guarantee that. Nobody can. Everyone thinks that they can, but you can't. I mean, you know, I'll give you an example. Like right now, I know the insurance companies are like, if, and Kevin might be able to speak to this, but like I know some districts that don't have multi-factor authentication on, right? When the person logs into the computer, they get the little token to go to their phone or whatever it is. The insurance companies are telling them they're not going to insure them or their rates are going to be tripled because they don't have MFA because MFA is a really way to stop someone from logging into your account. So, I mean, there's no guarantee. And school districts are targets because they know that school districts have the insurance and the money to pay for it. So, yeah. The, my, my, my question is, if they did lock us down, uh, do we or can we have the backup that, that, that so to come back on? I don't, it would depend what would happen. Okay. Yeah, it depends what happens and how it happens and the depth of how it happens and stuff like that. I mean, we do have multiple backups of things, but there's no, I don't even like talking about it, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> You're making me nervous, I won't sleep tonight. <laughs> Jerry, just as a, a follow-up, and maybe this is a question for the Finance Committee, but just our insurance would cover a ransomware situation or we would have to review the policies no the insurance company does cover it we have coverage yeah we have cyber okay. insurance we have cyber insurance yeah um okay and then um where else what else are some things i highlighted um and then so let me go on sorry i'm reading off my sheet too okay so we covered this and then okay so here these are just basic some of the things were just moved i mean we really did a, a good job of really looking and saying okay if we have other stuff where can we take believe it or not my budget went down a bit you know because we have some of the uh, essa funding that um, alana was able to help us with too um one of the slight items that went up you'll see is the line item with the library at Kutchog east um, we have a new library in there. She's doing a phenomenal job, and she's really gone through the library and done like a big cleanup and, and got rid of with a lot of you know stuff that wasn't really good in there that needed to be discarded. And so now she's just asked for some more money for some additional books and stuff like that. So um, so that's that one. And then lastly, on my last slide here is. Um, like I said, the drivers with our software on the databases, there, if the software wasn't being utilized, we really went through it line by line and made some adjustments. Um, you know, that includes, you know, the Z space and I think New Zilla, a couple of other items. Um, the software at the high school, same thing, we made some adjustments there. And then um, software district-wide, since we're really kind of focusing it on the buildings now, we like to have some district-wide because something always comes up that we need and we want to be able to support it. Um, so, you know, we've been fortunate that we've been able to do that. So, um, that was just some STEM lab stuff, if you haven't seen, but I, all the robotics that, you know, we've been able to get for Megan and stuff in the STEM lab. And then, um, that's it. So, thank you. Any more questions? That's great, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thank sure. you. What? <laughs> <laughs>
Good evening. I'm going to walk you through the uh, health, physical education, and athletics budget um, as it plays out from this current year to uh, moving into the future and how all students are meeting the vision of the mission statement in health, physical education, and athletics. Instructionally, this presentation is really going to talk about sustaining and maintaining what we currently have. Um, not, you're not going to see many changes in there. Um, this year, we're continuing to meet the PE regulations, which I've always been very, very proud of to meet those PE regulations in the elementary school. Having the opportunity to have students um, attend physical education class three times a, a week is pretty unique. Um, it is the New York State standard, but not everybody does it, and we've been able to do it now for, um, I've been here 14, so uh, 13 of the 14 years that I've been here, we've moved into that direction and we've been able to maintain that. I'm really proud of that and that's, that's really the Board of Education has helped to support the staffing to do that. We have um, continued in, in our K-6 to health education program and that's only growing and we're finding ways to push into more classes and get more, more classes involved or more grades or classes within a grade level, more opportunities per week or per, per month um, throughout the year to have a, a health education by a health education teacher. We've added, as Mr. Smith talked about, our food-based elective classes, the Food for Fuel and the Foods Around the World. They're very well um, populated with students. Um, it's, it's an elective that a lot of kids are, are signing up for, and you'll see that we'll continue that in next year. The elementary fitness trail, I just bring that up as that's finally going to come to fruition um, this June or July. It, it was in a previous budget in front of some of our capital um, uh, funding, but I just wanted to highlight that that is on its way and that will certainly support the programs of health and physical education and, and the academics uh, areas at large in the elementary school. We currently offer 22 sport, we have 22 different sport offerings. Um, with 58 total athletic teams this year. Um, you'll see our unified basketball team kick off the ground this year. Um, we, we weren't able to run it last spring um, during the, during the, the, the pandemic, um, and hopefully we get that off the ground this year. We added and, and competed, as I spoke about in our last meeting, our first competitive cheer season, which was uh, very successful. You'll see outside that the athletic, uh, on the north side of the, of the building, that the athletic field rate renovation has been done. Um, outdoor Wi-Fi capability has been installed. That's supported really through Ms. Doherty's budget, um, but it does support what we do on the outside for athletics. We've had live streaming this year, and then um, we've been able to increase and upgrade some of our athletic trainer supplies to meet the uh, physical needs of our student athletes. Greg, how many um, of of the athletic teams are combined with other schools? So we have a few that we host and a few that we send out. So we host boys and girls lacrosse and, and wrestling and junior high softball. But we send out football and JV and varsity softball. So at the end of the year, there is some revenue generated from those combined sport teams, but okay. then it's usually a wash with the ones that we send out. So it's pretty even, okay. it's pretty balanced. There are some transportation costs involved in the shuttling process, but they're, they're minimal. And there's no grant opportunities when you combine sports like that in different districts? No, not that I'm aware of. Um, there, there may be, you know, Pat, there, there is some grant opportunities in startup programs. So let's say you wanted to combine a startup something brand new. There are some avenues to find some grant money in that, but we're not starting up a new, right. like a crew team or something like that. That would, they might have some startup money. Thank you, mm -hmm. um, Greg. The elementary fitness trail is that coming out of last year's budget? That actually is coming out of last year's fund balance. Um, at the end, I believe that's where it came from. I have to think back. It was. But it's not in this new budget. No, okay. no. I'm just highlighting that these are some of the things that will be, that you'll see in the 2021-22 school over. year that were funded previously oh, or in, in a budget prior. I believe that was fund balance though at the end of 20, 21, somewhere. 
So this is kind of the nuts and bolts of the health and physical education and athletics budget. And this is really just what it takes to operate. What you don't see in this budget, the majority of what operates or runs athletics in general, you'll see come out of the transportation and facilities presentation. And possibly Mr. Coffey or Mr. Petretti's overall um, um, staffing. So, but a lot of it is out of transportation and facilities. Much of what I do is lives in facilities that Mr. Kelly will touch on later. Um, Speaking of staffing, Mr. Wormuth, what's your staffing for, for that? I have 7.2 uh, full-time employees. So, it, 7.2. Yeah, I have. Full and point two part. Yes and no. I have <laughs> six full in the department, and then I have 2.6s. Mr. Dolson being a dean shares part of the day there, and then it, the other piece is picked up by another point six. So it, it, it comes out to 7.2, but um, in, in people, it's, uh, it's all over the place. We've got to like, draw pictures of that. And that's, enough. How that one's and that's enough to run both buildings. That's enough. Um, there is one shared staff member um, from the elementary school who does one period per day here at the high school. In, and works on a, on a high school schedule, teaches first period here, and then spends the rest of the day at the elementary school, but it ends the day on the high school schedule. And how about health? Health is, um, health is, is fully supported in staffing. Um, I currently have three, um, I have the two full-timers here at the high school, and the 1.6 is also dual certified, it covers. Um, along with the two elect the food electives that are within my de within this department, and then the elementary health is covered by a certified health phys ed teacher as well. So, really, the elementary health is finding the time and the day to put it in there. Yeah. We have so yeah. many so many so offerings many. in elementary yeah. school that it's uh, it's just finding the time to get that. Yeah, that's a challenge. That's really a challenge. Mm -hmm. The big difference that you're going to see in this from 2021-22 um, to 22-23, very, very minimal. There's one move in the, um, in, the, in the general instruction code, and that's uh, $4,550, $4, $4, and that's the addition of food. That's the addition of food for those two food classes, okay? So, and then... The other little change in there is a one point, uh, a one and a half percent increase in our contractual dues and service fees. So those went, those were um, up to 1.5 percent this year for the state and the section. So otherwise, it's 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 flat, um, and it has been right around this number for many many years. What are we planning on doing in the future? Is really supporting and maintaining what we do. Um, continuing our K-12 health education initiatives, um, maintaining our compliance in PE, continuing those electives that we offer. Um, right now, we're, we're, we're going to continue with the food-based electives, those two, but there are always ideas coming forward in the future that students come up with that um, we try to hope to support our, of all departments, but um, ours has some unique flexibility, the health and PE department. Um, we, uh, working with Ms. Allegro, we've been able to and planning on continuing to expand our adapted PE opportunities for that student population, both through um, instruction and outside, which you'll see at the bottom through our unified sports offerings. Um, and then really it's um, taking care of what we have. We've got to maintain our fitness center, and that uh, comes with a price tag annually. Not a lot, but we have to put some cash into there to keep that place going and, and uh, safe. Um, as far as athletics, what are we looking to do? Um, we've, we're looking to increase our unified sports offerings to um, from just basketball to now soccer and bowling. Um, that should be coming along in 22-23. It'd be nice to send those that same student population out to the soccer field and to the bowling alleys. Um, and really looking to maintain the, uh, the, the 58 different sport um, teams that we have and then maintain our athletic, our athletic facilities, our equipment and supplies. And like I said, a lot of that comes, um, you'll see that in the facilities um, presentation. And then I added the scoreboard in here, as that will be a new addition, even though um, we talked about it prior, that that's mm -hmm. going to be taken from some, some funding at the end of this year. Mm -hmm. 
Well, that's, that, that's the nuts and bolts of the health and PE and athletics presentation. It's really about maintaining what we have and continuing our success in those areas. But Greg, do you see us adding more combined sports as enrollment drops? Or you know, does it's lack a, of enrollment stop a sport it, from running? It's something that you have, we have to pay attention to, not just here at Mattituck, but definitely for us. But our neighbors in South Oakland Greenport is something eventually is going to drop. Mm. Right? We're just not going to be. We I showed you we have 22 different sports right. and 58 different teams. Yeah. It's not sustainable. Right. Not with the population, <laughs> right? But combining could be. So I could anticipate possibly a tennis combination at some time. Um, where where Mr. Dolce and I were talking about. We're probably going to, we're, we're really thinking about dropping JV girls tennis in the fall and adding junior high girls tennis, which mm -hmm. we never had. Mm -hmm. So bypassing that mid-level, go junior high and varsity right. and getting those kids engaged and then getting them up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have yeah, to kind of be creative, creative yeah. um, in some of the things that we're doing. But I, I think, yeah, some of the things we're, we're going to combine in when it makes sense um, and if you have student support in it, you know, there's enough people, kids that want to do it. Greg, what if they're, um, not sure how the process work, if there's interest from some students to try to do another sport that we don't offer or we're not combined, such as field hockey, swimming, or gymnastics, like how does that come about? So we, prior to, to me coming here, we were combining field hockey with uh, Greenport hosts a, a field hockey team and South Hole combines with them. Um, I haven't really ever heard any interest of going back to field hockey. And then you have to weigh out those options. So if we added another female sport in the fall season, such as field hockey, something else is definitely going down, right? So will we be able to maintain soccer, cross country, girls tennis, and volleyball in that fall season with the addition of field hockey? And it's the same question when it comes to boys volleyball. So if we add boys volleyball during that fall season where there's football, golf, soccer, cross country, and there might be one more in there. That's the demise, I think, at that point. That'll be the demise of the football program, and that's a North Fork program. So you have to really balance what, what it is you're going to pick and choose. You know? it's, but it, it's, ha it's happened, though. I mean, we mm -hmm. started competitive cheer this year, right? That was a group of young ladies that, you know, were, were pushing on us and organized and they, uh, they recruited a coach on staff, and we were able to, to run that this year. But to what Mr. Worm is saying, that was done in the winter season when we really just had girls basketball. It wasn't up against a lot of things. So. And that's how winter track came about. Yeah. It was really student-driven, and the board and administration, we got on it. We said, let's do it. You know, so um, in my experience, if I've come to you as a Board of Education and ever asked for another program or another team, you, you've always seen the benefit of that for our students, and, and you know, I've always enjoyed and appreciated that. So I think and I hope we would continue that if, if the need came about. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Greg, do you know off the top of your head, say, what percentage of our students participate in the athletic 53. Um, what can we do to get more involved in that? So 53% of our student population this year is currently um, involved in athletics grades 7 through 12. You know, in comparison to other districts throughout the county, that's a very high end. So with all the things that are offered, if we can get 53% of them, I think we're doing a great job to, to get more um, students involved. I, I think some of the avenues that we're taking right now um, you know, one one particular is um, through Mr. Moraes and, and our our Spanish population, and we've seen an increase in those students participating in sport. And if we can continue to grow that population's participation, I think we could see our numbers move um, upward to 60 percent. There was a year at one point in time I can't remember exactly which year it was, but I was at, we were at 64 percent of our student wow. population participating in sports. Um, that was a I want to say 2015, it was a, a very heavy, um, involved group of, of student athletes. A counterpoint to that, 
What's the percent that participates in clubs? Clubs, I wouldn't know. Mr. Smith may know I that one. Pull the data. I don't know yeah, that, that, that'd be a big data mine for sure. Yeah, just curious, yeah. you know, what percent of our population isn't doing anything? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, sometimes the ones, the kids that are in sports are also in, in clubs. The clubs. Yep. Yeah. I don't know if you if you if you come around here at two thirty in the afternoon, it's, it's packed busy. still. It's, <laughs> it's still a busy place, you know. So I would dare say the majority of our kids are involved in, are involved something, in something after school. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? I just want to say thank you to everybody. I know creating a budget is a monumental task on every level, from clerical to administration to the teachers. So thank you very, very much. Um, at this juncture, we're going to ask for audience communication. Please come up to the podium, state your name, residence, and topic, and you'll be allowed to speak. Um, good evening, Tanya from Punchog. Hi, everybody. Nice to see everybody's Hi, faces. It's kind of cool. Um, okay, so I broke it down. Some of them um, kind of overlap, so we'll get there when we get there. Okay, please keep class sizes small. With our little guys who haven't been able to see their faces, they might have a little bit of social emotional delay. And all the studies that I've read say that you know small classes would be helpful, and that's what makes math tech. Math tech. Uh, classroom libraries, everybody touched on it, but I know the Scholastic Book Flyers come home, I order a few books, they go, the teacher can then buy books. How many books are we talking about? Like, what is the actual, like, dollar number? Like, what do these teachers need? And what is the end goal? Are we getting rid of our library? Jerry touched on that we got a new librarian at Kachuggies. That's fabulous. Mrs. Chartis was wonderful, and it's great we've got a new person down there, but why does everybody need books? I love books. Miss Littorello is a library. It talks at me the evil eye. Books are wonderful, but um, I feel like us parents constantly support our teachers in buying these books and getting them new books. But three of you commented on it, so what's the, what's the deal with the books? That's, that's an ongoing process of updating classroom books as new literature comes out, different things come out. Yeah, um, the classroom libraries, initially when you start reading and writing workshop, you, you build up a classroom library. There's a big investment up front um, when you start reading workshop. Uh, those books have to be replenished year after year. Those books have to meet the needs of the students in your class each year, so sometimes you need to purchase new books to support that. They also support the units of study, um, and it's really an ongoing um, investment to maintain them once okay. they're built. I just don't recall ever hearing so much about books yeah. no, and, and other and budgets. And it yeah, was just kind probably of because of the reading workshop and the writing workshop that okay. is part of our curriculum now, and it does not take away from the school library. That's a very different use. Okay. Um, so. Um, the flexible furniture that we have for our K-3 year olds, are we going to expand that eventually up until the sixth grade? I know my daughter does love the special chair and some of the other friends that she has. Are they have plans to come to the high school? Like, is yeah, this going to be we like an option started, that everyone gets? Yeah, we started in the high school, and we're looking to expand at the secondary level as well. Okay. It's just a big investment. So oh, yeah. Furniture is very expensive. It in, yeah. um, talking of expenses, everybody has copy paper on their thing. Nobody's copy paper went up, but I know when I go to Staples, a ream of copy paper that used to be $5 is now like 8 to $10. So how come we didn't budget more money for copy paper. Are we not making more copies? We are working with our teaching staff to not have to make as many copies. That's <laughs> lovely. Better for the environment. <laughs> yes. Good the answer, Lorax Sean. thanks you. <laughs> That's another good book, Dr. Seuss. The Lorax thanks you. Okay. Um, we all talked about a wellness screener, the sharing of the social workers, and um, there was another name that someone said. A behavior consultant. These people are great. I am CEPTO's president, uh, vice co-president, whatever. Um, I don't even know who these people are. I didn't even know we had them in their district. Can we do like a little PowerPoint video for the parents and send it out, like we send out everything else to say, this is who this person is, and this is who this person is, and this is who this person is. Because sometimes we have a child at home that might have a crisis and not knowing that there is a wellness screener or a behavioral consultant or someone that we could email quick and say, hey, this is what's going on with my child today on whatever day. Can you look in on that? I didn't even know these people existed. Or I, what I, is their job 
to do. I, I think, you know, your, your point person for your child is going to be either a classroom teacher at the elementary level or Kelly Pickering, the junior high guidance counselor, and at the secondary level, it's going to be your child's guidance counselor. Um, you know, and oftentimes your behavior specialist and stuff like that, if they're working with your child, they're, they're at the CSE meetings with you and, and, and that's where they're meeting you. Um, but as a parent who's been doing CSA meetings for 12 years now for Victoria and six years for Juliana, I don't even know who these people are. I don't even know their face. If I'm in the school or I'm somewhere in town and I happen to run into them, I don't even know their face. Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, I know we just hired a whole bunch of them and you've hired new people and that's great and that's wonderful and I appreciate it, hire, hire, hire. But who are these people? Send out a little bio, just like you'd hire a new person because they feel like it's, yeah, we you did, know. We did and then our newsletter. kids talk to them. No, um, our kids get discussed with these people and then they come home and they say, oh, I spoke, I, you know, they, that person came in and they spoke to me and things like that. Great if you're a parent, if you know who the, the they are, or who's talking to our children, and what are they talking about. But anyway, that's that. Um, so I would like a little video of, hey, look who we got, shine them. I mean, it's great that we have them. It's a, a large budget thing, and rock star them out. That's my philosophy. Um, the new electives for the junior, senior high school. Do we have all the supplies for them, and do we have that budgeted in? Astronomy, yes. a telescope is super expensive. Yes. Not a telescope. That's a yes, telescope. we do have that budget in it. Okay. Yes. As long as we do, I just yep. have experience with not having the budget. On um, the special ed budget, it said Naviance for sixth grade. Is that the same Naviance that they have for the high school kids? Mm -hmm. Like yeah. the computer planning thing? Yes. Mm -hmm. Cool. That's good. Cool. Okay. Almost done. Almost done. <laughs> um, see, <laughs> <laughs> curriculum or special ed, I'm not sure. Um, I didn't hear mention of the summer school extended school year or any of those kind of things. I know we spoke about enrichment, but if your child deemed it in their IEP, I know I wait till the budget is done to figure out if I'm, we're having it, but it wasn't, I didn't see it anywhere. It's actually not a budgeted item. It's reimbursed by the state. So it, it has nothing to do with the budget. So we can plan that before June? <laughs> it is planned and it, yeah, yeah. It's okay, we've it's never been able to plan it before June, funded. so I've always had to wait and put my child, my children, on like a hold because I don't know the camp you just have to schedule. Wait for their CSE meeting. Once what? they have once they have their CSE meeting and the recommendation is made, you can make your summer plans. Okay, perfect. That's better. I like that. Um, a Chromebook insurance. Um, it said that we have that covered until 2024, and then parents will have to pay for that. Or how is that working? Or we get that's another that's one of those items that you know we're using the ESSA funds to do that right now. So. And those ESSA funds run out, that's a decision that we'll have to make as a board. Are we going to take that back on, which we did? I can tell you now this administration is probably going to recommend that we need to find room in the budget to do that. Yes, I agree. I like that idea. But there's going to be a couple things when those ESSA funds fall off that are going to drive the budget up. Yeah, well, I figured that. Um, unified sports, how do we do the staffing for them or for sports staffing? Or how do we do staffing? for the clubs and for the things. Do we need to budget more money for those kinds of things so that the teachers are incentivized, is that a word, I don't know, to do that? Because I feel like we have all these wonderful, great ideas and then like nobody wants to do it. Well, luckily, I mean, all of our clubs are running. We're, you know, the, the one area that we struggle with is the, our, our, our summer, you know, some of the summer enrichment programs. Um, but during the course of the year, we're able to, uh, to you know, reach out, we start with posting with the staff, and if we don't get anybody in-house to uh, run those clubs or coach a sport, we then go out to the community. But now, for the summer school stuff, and to, I mean, is it is it is it a matter of money? Do the teachers need a couple more hundred bucks or something? Like what? Like it's, how do we get them to do it? Because it's such a wonderful value for our students and for our population. But I feel like we have this the staff problem, like was stated. Well, you know, and, and I'll even go back and I'll let Mr. Wormuth interject. We, we had two staff that came to us and wanted to run a full-on summer program, I oh, want to yes. say five or six years ago, and planned and prepped and advertised, <laughs> and we didn't have, none of the students wanted to do the program. It wasn't yeah. viable. Right. Um, two years ago, we tried to run a pro, pre-COVID, we tried to run a, we tried again to run a program, and we posted and we, we just couldn't get the teachers at that point in time. Um, I didn't feel at that point in time it was a 
financial thing. Okay. It was more of a commitment thing. Okay. I mean, because I think the community at large, from speaking to them, that if our kid could go to a camp at their school, it would be much better than the camps out here. And the camps out here are already all shut out. Like, if you want to send your kid anywhere for even time, they're shut out. They're done. And it's March. March 1st, everybody had a waiting list. So, you know, it's, think about that maybe we shift money's ground or something and then offer something. Because I know our parents need it. And we're about. Okay? That's all I have. Thanks. Hello, my name is Carrie Chittick. Um, I'm in Laurel. I don't, do you need my address? I don't know how That's much okay. information. No. Um, so as far as planning with the budget, um, when you guys do for the schools, do you, is there like direct contact with like the teachers to get a feeling as to like what they feel maybe they need um, so far as like classroom support or maybe program ideas, enrichment stuff, um, or maybe even so far as just like physical items that maybe they need back in their class after moving stuff out from COVID? Like is that all like a conversation so that you guys it's, have? It's, the budget process starts with the teachers. Okay. And they develop their budgets and then run them either through grade levels or at the high school through their departments. And from there we build a department budget and then building level budgets. So it kind of, it starts from the ground level with teachers. Um, you know, other ideas, programmatic ideas, those are things that are coming about through conversation year round with teachers. Okay. You know, that typically bring stuff to us and things that they want to do. Okay. I figured that there was lots of open communication through everything. I just, or how that worked or how it trickled down. Um, and then I also just wanted to say that I am also in favor of the small classes, um, especially in kindergarten one and two, you know, um, there's no dedicated aid as far as I know. Um, I was in um, kindergarten, he's now in fourth grade. <coughs> there was a dedicated aid in each of the kindergarten classes for his year, but I don't think that still exists. I think there's maybe one that floats around. Yeah. Um, so I really think that it's kind of important to keep, especially those younger kids in the smaller classes. Um, and of course, I'm always gonna, um, I'm always gonna advocate for um, my son's class. So the fourth grade going into the fifth grade, I would like to see that class, especially um, keep that extra session, uh, section because this year I think it was really a good thing for that class. Um, there's a lot of boys in that class and I think it's just a tough year and a tough class in general. So um, that's that. Um, and then also, so I'm on the board for the PTA in Kachog East and there's just a couple of things that I'll just mention. Um, other parents comment on um, maybe to take into consideration for the budget either this year or in coming years um, uh, the Z space and the stem and the computer labs like that has been like a big thing like kids are into I know we're talking about the con technology and everything um, computer lab I don't know if you got rid of that maybe because they were using whatever programs they were doing there maybe they're doing on their Chromebooks now in the classroom um, I'm not sure how that's working but the Z space like my son especially he's like when are we going to use that again that's great um, so I don't know if that was something that disappeared with COVID and not being able to use stuff or if it was teaching or staffing or Z space was it was a, a combination of things first of all COVID did shut it down okay. and, and we tried to restart it I know on the secondary level I could speak to it a little bit better we just couldn't get teacher buy-in and it, it's um, the annual licensing is it's, it's a big uh, price tag with that we're looking we have the computers we're looking at different ways on how we can potentially move them down to cut your yeast and and support their use down there um, where there seemed to be a, a little bit more interest in than what we had at the secondary level okay um. Also, a lot of parents talking about the after-school clubs. Um, that's great that you know everything is up and running this year, and we really appreciate that. Um, the kids seem to be enjoying it. Um, my question was, I just don't know. You met, mentioned Amy that um, some of them were full. Um, is there an option to like? Is there like a wait list for kids that are running, or can they run them again so that what other kids? What they've done is um, when they get full, like if it's a third and fourth grade club, what they'll do is um, the teachers have split it into two different days. So if the club would have been 10 sessions, they'll do five sessions with one grade and five sessions with the other. So all the kids have the opportunity to participate. It just might be less sessions overall. Okay. So I don't believe anyone has been turned down from any. Okay. Um, the Kachogi's playground that was also mentioned. I know that's been th tossed around it's in the five-year five plan. Yep. Um, 
summer recreational programs again I'm, I'll mention that I know it's been mentioned a couple of times parents seem to be very interested in that um, the summer camps out here are ridiculously expensive and um, the price is just like astronomical to have send your kid one kid one kid never mind if you have multiple kids to send them to a week of camp anywhere out here is just crazy so if there's any sort of um, program or anything that we could do for the um, for the parents and for the kids through the school that would be awesome um, there was also somebody that had mentioned um, interest in possibly um, a gifted and talented program at uh, Kachag East um, and then also orchestra program was mentioned I know once upon a time they had that in the high school level I guess um, no we, we tried yeah. as a club um, okay. at the at the elementary level at one point in time to run it and they just again we didn't have the interest at that point in time not enough okay um, and I, 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 because well, the, the enrichment programs come up at Cutchog East a couple of times. I've heard that in a couple of different places, and we've had conversation as an administrative team about that. And it, our feeling is we're running a, a, a gifted and talented program for all kids at Cutchog East. But is um, it for all kids or all quick kids that qualify It's for all under? kids. Um, in in the, the things that we're offering, foreign language, um, the STEM, you know all those different programs that we're pushing into during the course of the school day um, where in other places those would be pullouts we're pushing in and offering those things for all students um, the different forms of enrichment okay uh, and then the other thing is the kids the kids just love the steam and um, any of the science and technology so I, I don't know obviously there's probably not any more time to get them in there more frequently I'm sure you're squeezing it in as it is but those are um, you know big talks of the families yeah. and the kids so yeah. they enjoy those programs okay that's it thank, thank, you. thank, you. thank you Sean um, question I know when we try to do things over the summer or even after school sometimes we do have a problem trying to get some of the teachers to be involved especially over the last year and a half, two years. They're just burnt out. Um, is there a possibility, and I don't know, Kevin, if this is an insurance issue or anything like that, but get some of the parents to volunteer to, to work a program over the summer? I mean, if it's that big of a need for these kids, can we get the parents to, who are able to, um, to assist in that way? I mean, there's always a possibility for something like that. I mean, there's a lot of hurdles that they, the individuals involved would, would have to, you know, as far as fingerprinting and um, background check and stuff like that. But, I mean, anything's possible. I mean, if there's that much of a push for it, right. okay. you know, it, it's worth looking into. I just know that we run into the problem of, of the staffing. Yeah. And, uh, I had um, a comment. Um, and maybe we could conduct a survey, I'm thinking, of maybe to see what the interest is out there from parents or students for summer enrichment or for after school clubs. That way it may help us better prepare our budget for if there is an increased interest in clubs instead of allocating 10 sessions and then splitting it and kids only have five sessions where we can run double. Um, so maybe, we, maybe surveys might be something that could be done to get a better sense, we, just, just an idea. We could. Well, I, I think at the same time, if we do that, <laughs> we first have to find out if we can get teachers to, to do <laughs> We it. know that that's an issue. Mm -hmm. um, we know that that'll be an issue. Because we know that there's the interest, it's the other side that I think the problem is. Just maybe get more um, solid data from the students or from the parents. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? No? Okay. I need a motion to adjourn. Motion. Need a second? Yep. All in favor? Aye. Good night.